from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 48, recorded on February 14th, 2024. Valentine's Day. We're recording on Valentine's Day. And when I introduce Sarah, you'll you'll see if you watch YouTube that she has an appropriate nice red uh, blouse. I seem to have forgotten there is a little bit of redness on my bow tie. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Dong. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Yeah, I didn't have anything with hearts on it, but I went for the red <laughs> to represent our Valentine's Day show, even though folks will be listening to this after. But it's also Chinese slash Lunar New Year. So lots of good red color vibes out there. <laughs> okay. Well, very, very appropriate. And happy Valentine's Day to you, Sarah, and to all our yeah. listeners. A little bit, I guess, uh, late for them. Um, but Sarah, I, I just wanted to make sure you'll remember us little people as your fame grows. Uh, <laughs> congratulations on the the growing success of Febrile. Uh, something about the IDSA? Oh, <laughs> thanks, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, um, the IDSA is helping sponsor Febrile, so making it a little bit easier to keep bringing folks the same ID case type episodes that we've been doing. So I'm very uh, grateful for a little bit of help there. Well, also hopefully a little bit of uh, getting it out in front of people. I see it in my exactly. daily IDSA update. So yeah, for those who have not listened to Febrile, it's, this is actually how I came to know Sarah. So it's a great, <laughs> a great podcast, a great way to uh, case-based learning. So uh, yeah. 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 So I'm excited. This past you know, years. So I had less time to really invest in it. And so I'm hoping to get back in the swing of things and plan more series and, and fun adventures of Febrile. But back to Puscast. Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So on to the literature, shall we? All right. We will start with viral. Remember to listen to This Week in Virology, both the uh, weekly clinical update and the deep dive. Uh, but let me start with the article, Live Attenuated Tetravalent Butantan Dengue Vaccine in Children's and in Children and Adults. You see how I really have no confidence on how to pronounce the Butantan, but I'm just going for it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure people write in and let me know. So this was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And well, there it is. They have solved the mystery and viruses are actually alive. Do you see that? Live attenuated. Well, um, all joking aside, this is a bit of encouraging science. Um, here we have the results from an ongoing phase three double blind trial in Brazil where they randomly assigned participants to receive the Butantan um, dengue vaccine or placebo um, with stratification according to age. So you've got a two to six years, seven to 17 years, and 18 to 59 years. Five years of follow-up is planned. And, and I'm going to sort of circle back to why that's important. Remember, this is exciting, um, but this is not the final word. Now, the objectives of the trial are to evaluate overall vaccine efficacy against symptomatic virologically confirmed dengue of any serotype occurring more than 28 days after vaccination, that's the primary efficacy endpoint, regardless of serostatus at baseline, and to describe safety up to day 21, the primary safety endpoint. Here, vaccine efficacy was assessed on the basis of two years of follow-up for each participant and safety as solicited vaccine-related adverse events reported up to day 21 after injection. So we're sort of looking at reactogenicity, right? Um, key secondary objectives were to assess vaccine efficacy among participants according to dengue serostatus at baseline, according to dengue viral serotype. Um, efficacy according to age was also assessed. Over a three-year enrollment period, 16,235 participants received either the vaccine, that's 10,259, or placebo, that was 5,976. The overall two-year vaccine efficacy was an impressive 
25%. Um, and we've got confidence intervals. Um, now, the vaccine efficacy was 80.1% among participants 2 to 6 years of age, 77.8% among those 7 to 17, 90% among those 18 to 59 years of age. Um, so far, they are seeing um, different efficacies based on which serotype they looked at. So the efficacy against um, dengue serotype 1 was 89.5. Against dengue type 2 was 69.6. .6. Um, and did I read that right? Yep. And then also mm -hmm. dengue 3 and dengue 4, they weren't detected during the follow-up period. So we're not going to have um, you know much to say about that. Solicited systemic vaccine and placebo-related adverse events within 20 days were more common in people that got the uh, shot versus placebo, but not, not a big difference there. Um, and they have a really nice uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, cumulative incident uh, percent, um, and sort of following this out years um, since injection. And actually, it's, it's holding pretty low with vaccine. You can really see the unvaccinated group just getting a uh, rising cumulative incidence. So we will we won't want to wait for more data. This is not we're not we're not there yet. Um, and one of the reasons that um, a lot of us want to wait for more data is this whole this whole idea out there that um, when you get a second infection, it's worse than the first. We love to teach about antibody dependent enhancement, but is it a thing? So right here we have the article, another article: severe disease during both primary and secondary dengue virus infections in pediatric populations published in Nature Medicine and uh, covered as a deep dive on TWIV 1087. Now, when people talk about dengue, they often embrace the paradigm that severe dengue cases occur, occur mostly during secondary infections due to this antibody-dependent enhancement after infection with a different dengue virus serotype. Now, we covered a paper earlier about how this is not actually what we're seeing in travelers. And many have questioned this paradigm as, you know, most severe disease and deaths from dengue are actually in children. Um, and for a lot of these kids, it's first infection. So here the investigators examined 619 children with febrile dengue confirmed infection from three hospitals in different regions of India. Uh, for our listeners, India is now the, the king, shall we say, of dengue, more dengue there than anywhere else. Um, they classified primary and secondary infections based on IgM, IgG ratios using a dengue-specific enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay um, as per the WHO guidelines. They found that primary dengue infections accounted for more than half of the total clinical cases, um, severe dengue cases, more than half, and fatalities, five out of every seven. So this was consistent um, as they looked at different age groups. Um, so it might be a lot of fun to teach about antibody-dependent enhancement, um, you know, and it, and it may be important in vaccine testing, um, but perhaps it's not really such a thing clinically. I pulled a quick, uh, I'll just give a quick summary. Sorry, the article is not quick, but from Lancet ID, emergence of, I believe it's pronounced Orapooch, but you can correct me, Daniel, or someone else can send me a <laughs> I will message. definitely not correct you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Orapooch fever in Latin America, a narrative review. I actually picked this just because I had not heard of this virus before, and maybe other folks who are listening haven't. Um, Orapooch virus is an arbovirus that is considered emergent. You know, before chikungunya and Zika, um, had their time in the spotlight in particular in the recent years. Before that, this virus had been the second most frequent arbovirus uh, detected after dengue, although I think the true burden of disease is not clear. Um, you know, we don't have tons and tons of surveillance data. It was initially detected in the 50s in Trinidad and Tobago and now has been detected across Central and South America. So the reports have been from both sort of rural and forest areas in Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, Bolivia, Panama, Colombia, and Venezuela. Um, the illness itself is, it sounds like often mild and self-limiting. There's about a three to 10 day incubation period. 
Um, and if you do have symptoms, it sounds like it's typically the usual sort of febrile illness, headache, and so on. Um, in more uh, less common cases, there may be other symptoms like rash, retroorbital pain, anorexia, and hemorrhagic changes. Um, and very severe clinical presentations, it sounds like are rare, but it can cause some CNS infections that result in aseptic meningitis or meningioencephalitis. So just a a review of the topic. So I learned a lot. And um, if anyone wants to read more, they can check it out. All right. Well, a little more on vaccines. Um, The article, Human Cytomegalovirus MRNA 1647 Vaccine Candidate Elicits Potent and Broad Neutralization and Higher Antibody-Dependent Cellular Cytotoxicity Responses than the GBMF59 vaccine published in JID. Um, So this vaccine is an mRNA-based vaccine candidate encoding the HCMV, so the human CMV, GB, and pentameric complex. Um, The mRNA-1647 is currently in late-stage FC trials. Um, Just a little context here. So CMV viral attachment is mediated by this major envelope glycoprotein um, well, complexes on the virion surface. Um, The glycoprotein B, so that's the G capital B that we're looking at here, um, is the primary viral fusion protein. Um, There's also this pentameric complex. You must memorize this. This will be on the boards, um, (laughs) which is essential (laughs) for entry into epithelial, endothelial, dendritic, and monocytic cells. Um, So both this GB and we'll say PC, that pentameric complex, appear to be viable targets um, for antibody-based CMV interventions. So this vaccine will induce an immune response against the GB. Um, So we've got the two vaccines. We've got the mRNA. And then we've also got this GBMF59. Uh, both of these delivers, both of these are delivered via intramuscular injection. Um, the GBMF59 vaccine um, is co-developed by Sanofi and Novartis. It's it has been the most effic- efficacious human CMB vaccine tested to date, with approximately 50% protection in phase two trials. So not 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 what I want. Fifty percent is not as high as I would like. Um, now, a few little but perhaps important differences. Um, the GBMF59 uses a GB antigen um, that is transmembrane truncated, and the furin cleavage site mutated to enhance antigen expression and secretion, and then formulated in this MF59, um, an oil and water emulsion adjuvant. Now, the mRNA vaccine uses a nucleoside-modified mRNA, um, and it actually encodes the wild-type human CMV GB and PC encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle. So here they're going to go ahead, and they're going to demonstrate that the mRNA vaccine um, induces potent and durable human CMV-specific IgG responses in seronegative participants in a first-in-human vaccine trial, uh, mirroring some of the preclinical immunogenicity results. Um, It also boosted um, the human CMV-specific IgG responses in seropositive vaccinees. Um, We end up eliciting a broad and potent neutralization Uh, We also get FC-mediated effector functions, including this robust um, ADCC. So that's our antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Uh, So to compare the vaccines, that's what this is all about, the MRI vaccine resulted in lower GB-specific IgG responses, but higher neutralization and higher antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity compared to the GBMF59 vaccine. So all interesting. What does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're covering. You're <laughs> taking care of all the vaccinology for us, so I'm grateful. Uh, I pulled one other paper in our viral section. This one's from OFID, a multicenter assessment of the outcomes and toxicities of Foscarnet for treatment of acyclovir-resistant mucocutaneous herpes simplex in immunocompromised patients. Um, the paper opens with a great summary of acyclovir-resistant HSV disease and drug options, which if you have ever dealt with a patient in this scenario, you know that one, these can be very painful, multifocal, super uncomfortable lesions, but also it is just 
very challenging to treat. And, you know, Foscarna is generally the go-to, uh, but is limited by toxicities and suboptimal efficacy, which um, was seen in this study. So uh, multi-center retrospective study, they pulled patients from five participating centers and looked at adult patients treated with phosgarnet for HSV infection. So they were included if they had a mucocutaneous HSV lesion that was accessible uh, to follow by exam to see how it's healing. Patients were excluded if they had concurrent bacterial superinfection over the lesion, uh, pregnancy, prisoner, phosgarnet treatment if they um, received it as part of the pretelivir clinical trial. There were 29 patients identified, two patients accounted for two episodes each, um, so just a few last patients in that. Uh, these were mostly immunocompromised patients with hematologic malignancy, and 16 of the 19 had undergone an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, fewer than half of the patient's HSV infection episodes resolved fully by the end of their phosgonic course or in follow-up afterwards. The median duration of phosgonic use was 16 days. The median time to a healing lesion was 38 days. Um, not surprisingly, there were lots of adverse effects. Um, electrolyte issues were seen in over half of the episodes. Kidney dysfunction was seen in about a third of cases, and treatment was ultimately discontinued in 19%. Um, there were nine patients who died, which, you know, I think that says probably less about phosgarnet than it does um, about sort of the patients who are at risk for these types of infections. But you know, does give you some perspective on how sick and, um, what should I say, like tenuous that some of these patients are. So just an interesting view, you know, not a lot of patients, but this only comes up every so often. So I'm grateful to have some, some info, even if it's just a small group. All right. So moving on to bacterial, be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. The article, Dalba Got Back, Use of Dalbamancin for the Treatment of Vertebral Osteomyelitis was published in OFIID. You like you title. like the title, Sarah? Great title. Catchy. Yeah, I was mad you nabbed it before me. <laughs> <laughs> is it, what, what is that? Some expression I must be missing that you young folks use, Dalba <laughs> Got Back? What, what is that? Like baby got back? I don't know what that means. But. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> this is a retrospective cohort study where the authors report that in this group of patients, 85.3% of patients completed their Dalbavancin course. Adverse reactions occurred for 17.6% and infection recurrence in 8.8% within 90 days. They concluded that Dalbavancin appears to be safe and well tolerated for vertebral osteomyelitis. Um, when you start really looking into these patients, I'm not sure we're ready to change practice here. Um, there is an ongoing RCT, DOTS, D-O-T-S, Dalbavancin as an option for treatment of Staphylococcus bacteremia. Um, but that trial excludes vertebral osteomyelitis, so still a bit more to learn about where Dalbavancin fits in, despite the catchy title of this article. <laughs> So I'm assuming it's based on Baby Got Back, the Sir Mix a Lot song, but I could be wrong. I'm not too <laughs> hip. Okay. I'm I've been using Daba more recently than I had in the past, as, uh, trying to figure out how to use it in my practice. Um, so I pulled uh, one paper from MMWR Notes from the Field: Severe Vibrio Vulnificus Infections During Heat Waves, three Eastern U.S. states. July to August 2023. So this report shared 11 cases of severe Vibrio infection. These patients were in North Carolina, so there was seven patients there, two in Connecticut, and two in New York. The median age of those affected was seven years old, and all but one had at least one underlying condition, so diabetes, cancer, heart disease, alcohol use history, hematologic uh, disease of some kind. Six patients experienced septic shock or died. Um, three experienced both. And when looking at the transmission, it seems like most of the cases were waterborne transmission into a wound uh, from some you know water source along the Atlantic coast. That's the guess for six of the cases. Uh, two were related to raw food handling, 
with a cut on the hand. These read just like board questions. One had raw oysters and one, it sounds like maybe was a mixture of had a wound and was eating raw oysters. Um, so just to note, these occurred during those record-breaking, awful U.S. heat waves um, that I'm sure everyone remembers. So even though it can't you know, officially be tied to that in this report, we do know that water surface temperatures and low salinity and sort of the setting is favorable for Vibrio growth. So I thought that was interesting. Okay. The article, It's Uncomplicated, Prevention of Urinary Tract Infections in an Era of Increasing Antibiotic Resistance, was published in PLOS Pathogens. Um, what, do you, what do you think, Sarah? You think they're, they're trying to make the titles clever to get on <laughs> IV Puscast? All right. It's a, it's a nice review with lots of references on uh, you know, what we know so far, potential therapeutics under investigation. Um, but I just want to say, make sure to read the article and not just start by uh, just looking at stuff in the figures because um, it gives you this this whole like list of things to try how does it work um, but you really need to kind of look a little closer because a lot of this is still in the the theory the idea um, you know I guess hypothesis to use that word correctly because it's definitely not at the theory level um, so yeah just very interesting to to look at the different options out there but make sure to look a little deeper into the actual evidence behind these different um, interventions yeah and sharing that with patients so they don't have these super high expectations of that magical over-the-counter pill that has d and cranberry and everything else in it. yes <laughs> um and i I actually pulled another one, I forgot, from MMWR. Uh, this was new CDC lab recommendations for syphilis testing in the U.S., 2024. Um, you know, I'm obviously not going to read all of this because it is a huge document. Um, but, you know, they're, they have a little bit of clarification section on terminology. Uh, as a reminder, I think everyone knows of the sort of breakdown of non-treponemal tests, which could be more accurately called lipoidal antigen test, a treponemal test, and then nonspecific antibodies, you know, characterizes antibodies that are not specific to treponema pallidum, but are detected in non-treponemal test. Um, I think the big take home is that our testing is still pretty limited. We are using, you know, these antibody testing, you can technically diagnose based on dark field or fluorescent microscopy or histology, but we don't have NATS. Culture is very cumbersome. There are some point of care tests available out there, although I'm not, I don't know that that is widely available. Um, but you can check out, there's still the traditional versus uh, reverse sequence algorithm. So the traditional meaning you start with your non-treponemal lipoidal antigen um, serologic test, so something like your RPR, or the sort of reverse if you start with a treponemal serologic test. So I think most of um, those sort of the flow chart is going to be familiar, but uh, there's, you know, a couple additional updates and lots of details in there for people to refer to. So just so that you know, there is an update and to go you know, type in CDC syphilis the next time you have questions or um, have that come up with a patient. All right. The article, doxycycline versus azithromycin in patients with scrub typhus. A systematic review of literature and meta-analysis was recently published in BMC Infectious Diseases. So um, being a meta-analysis that has all those issues, and they conclude with current data from studies with a high risk of bias to not find statistically significant differences in clinical outcomes between doxycycline and azithromycin for scrub typhus. So we actually need a good study. Mm, heard of that. I have a paper from CID, extensively drug-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa outbreak associated with artificial tears. I like following up and sharing updates on things that we've brought up on PUSCAST. So we had talked about this before. I, I, I'm i guessing it would have been an MMWR or something similar at the time. Um, but this summarized the carbapenemase producing carbapenem resistant pseudomonas outbreak that was occurring in 2022 and 2023. There were 81 cases identified from 18 states. 27 of those cases were found on surveillance cultures. Four or 7% of the 54 case patients with clinical cultures 
died within 30 days of their culture collection. Four or 22% of 18 patients with eye infections required enucleation. Um, and artificial tear use was reported by 87% of the 70 case patients who had that information provided. Um, a little over three quarters of those patients reported use of the over-the-counter artificial um, tear brand. And then they later found uh, this bacteria isolated from both opened and unopened bottles um, and sort of linked this back to the manufacturing site. You know, the um, investigation found that the bacteria was isolated from those unopened products, indicating, of course, that they're not sterile. And I think the inspection found a lot of the practices that may have led to the sources of contamination. So after this, the FDA proposed legislative changes to strengthen regulatory requirements for sterile manufacturing facility inspections after this. It sounds like the current U.S. Um, system allowed foreign-based manufacturers to ship over-the-counter products without FDA inspection. So the inspection to work up uh, this outbreak was sort of the first evaluation of that site. Um, and I think the other sort of big, cool part of this invest investigation was how they had used whole genome sequencing-based case definitions to help find isolates from various different healthcare settings and culture sources. So an update um, with some sad outcomes for a lot of those patients. Oh, and I have our next one. I'm moving us into the fungal section. There are a lot of good fungal papers this week, or these two weeks. The first one I pulled is from OFID, uh, MSG15, Suba itraconazole versus conventional itraconazole in the treatment of endemic mycoses, a multicenter open-label randomized comparative trial. So Suba itra, or super bioavailable, sorry, bioavailability itraconazole, is a novel antifungal. The formulation contains a, I will quote here, solid dispersion of itraconazole in a pH-dependent polymeric matrix to enhance both dissolution and intestinal absorption. So basically easier for us to absorb. This open-label randomized trial evaluated efficacy, safety, and pharmacokinetics of the suba itra compared to conventional itra in adult patients who had proven or probable infection with endemic mycoses. And they found that it was bioequivalent, well-tolerated, and efficacious with a more favorable safety profile. Um, so for those patients that were included, it was a mixture of different infections. There were 51 with histo, 18 with blastomycosis, 13 with coccidio, and 6 with sporotrichosis. So would be this is a great option to help with a lot of the drawbacks of conventional itraconazole, including uh, absorption challenges, food and acidity requirements, and limited tolerability. All right. The article, Healthcare Resource Utilization and Discharge Readiness in Adult Hospitalized Patients with Candemia or Invasive Candidiasis, who received an echinocandin, an analysis of United States hospitals published in open form infectious disease. So are we keeping those folks in the hospital too long? Here we have the results of a retrospective multicenter observational study that was performed using the PINC AI healthcare database, looking at hospitalized adult patients with candidemia or um, invasive candidiasis who received greater than or equal to three days of an echinocandin. Um, they looked at uh, post-index culture hospital costs, discharge location. Now, patients were considered potentially dischargeable earlier than actual um, hospital discharge day if they met the following three criteria prior to their actual hospital discharge day. Resided on a non-intensive care unit hospital ward. Can't send them straight out of the ICU, apparently. Received any oral medication. So, hey, why aren't they getting their candida medicine by mouth? And had no diagnostic therapeutic interventions. So, a total of 1,865 patients met the study criteria. Of the 1,008 patients on a kinocandin near hospital discharge and discharged alive, 
42.9% were potentially dischargeable prior to their actual hospital day. Most patients, 35.8%, were discharged to a long-term care facility. I think the plurality, I would say. Um, so I spent some time uh, trying to understand the implications here. So for context, I went to a page by the CDC on antimicrobial resistance in Canada. Um, about 7% of all Canada blood samples tested at CDC were resistant to the antifungal drug fluconazole. So really, we've got about 93% of these folks that could be leaving on an oral fluconazole regimen. Uh, this next one I thought was a very interesting question about PJP, and I had not really read about this literature before. This paper was from OFID. Comparison of nasopharyngeal swab versus lower respiratory tract specimen PCR for the diagnosis of pneumocystis. Oh, I always forget how to pronounce PJP pneumonia. <laughs> right, uh, this is, <laughs> fact, yeah. uh, this was a retrospective cohort study from Queensland looking at adult patients with clinically suspected PJP who had a PCR performed on a lower respiratory tract specimen, so either induced butum or a BAL. And they also had a nasopharyngeal swab collected within seven days of their lower respiratory tract specimen. 111 patients met inclusion criteria. Of those, 71 had PJP. So this was based on they were clinically suspected to have the disease and they had a positive PJB PCR from their lower respiratory tract. And then there were 40 patients who did not have PJP. And the diagnostic sensitivity that they reported from, from this study of a nasopharyngeal swab, PJP PCR was 0.66, specificity of one, positive predictive value of one, negative predictive value of 0.63. So just to actually focus on the numbers since they're relatively approachable for us to talk about. For patients who did not have PJP, they all had negative nasopharyngeal PJP PCR results. For the patients who did have the PJP diagnosis, 66% of those had positive PJP PCR from a nasopharyngeal swab. So they um, here did not have false positives, suggesting that a positive PCR on an upper respiratory sample is sufficient for diagnosis and sort of suggesting that the colonization of the upper respiratory tract would not be a barrier. Um, the other thing that's interesting that they looked at um, the false negative nasopharyngeal swabs and found that they had a significantly lower ERV3 load, so endogenous retrovirus, demonstrating that there probably was a component of maybe l less, um, oh, sorry, not less good. <laughs> I think it maybe uh, they got less cellular They material. got less sample. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, I think I didn't realize that there were some other papers out there that have found a lack of uh, false positives that argue against this hypothesis that if there's colonization of the upper respiratory tract, that it is an issue. Um, so interesting clinical question. Obviously, it would be very nice if we didn't have to get that and do sputum or a BAL. So maybe it is helpful if you had a positive nasopharyngeal swab. Um, you know, I guess the question is, would people feel confident enough that that um, rules in the diagnosis? And, and maybe that that could be the case that we could use it. Yeah, I, I like the fact, Sarah, they mentioned the ERV3 loads because yeah. I think people don't realize, like, people say, oh, I got a great nasal sample. It was all this goop on there. But you don't really want the goop. You want the cells, right? <laughs> You're like, get this. Don't give me That's the goop. <laughs> get me the cells. And yeah, so, like, yeah, I think maybe people in the study weren't even getting good NP swabs as we saw. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Um, and I actually realized I probably should have checked to see, like, if, for example, I don't know um, if lab, if all labs would be validated to run the PJP PCR off of the nasopharyngeal swab, but I'm guessing a lot of people are sending out these tests to reference labs, so maybe they actually do do that. Um, and then the other thing I also included in our fungal section was a paper from Lancet ID 
uh, which is new Cryptococcus management guideline. So global guideline for the diagnosis and management of cryptococcosis, an initiative of the ECMM and ISHAM in cooperation with the ASM. Uh, so again, this is another document that is very comprehensive that I'm not going to be able to cover all of, but just to emphasize some of the key points, obviously your first branch point is trying to determine what is the clinical syndrome that you're dealing with. So CNS infection, disseminated infection, isolated pulmonary disease, or direct skin inoculation. The authors recommend liposomal amphotericin B, three to four mg per kg plus flucytosine 25 mg per kg four times per day as the most optimal induction therapy. So this is for cryptomeningitis, disseminated crypto, severe isolated pulmonary crypto. And this is specifically in high income settings. And they incorporated the ambition trial, which we've discussed on podcast before, by saying in low income settings, patients with HIV associated cryptomeningitis are best treated with life of liposomal amphotericin B, 10 mg per kg for that single dose with 14 days of flucytosine and fluconazole, a high dose as induction therapy. And then, you know, there are some other components here that uh, authors emphasize not stopping or switching to an inferior regimen too early or unnecessarily. And they give some breakdowns and figures that look at the uh, sort of uh, tiers of best to least best therapy options. And as a reminder, you would not escalate antifungal therapy for persistent blood antigenemia, persistently positive CSF cryptococcal antigen, visible cryptococci in the CSF without culture positivity or abnormal CSF microscopy, as these are not necessarily indicators of microbiologic failure. So you really need to see that growth on culture. Um, So uh, there, I put a couple of the images here. Figure one is a really nice kind of overall look at first line therapy by syndrome. Uh, the other figures walk through, um, you know, selecting therapy in various settings, including HIV and solid organ transplant. And panel five has this really nice summary of sort of the 10 principles of cryptococcal meningitis management as well. So it is interesting to have sort of a uh, separation for the high and low income settings. And, uh, you know, I don't have a sense of how people feel about that and how to apply in their practice. But I think throughout they, you know, give lots of caveats of about trying to individualize to what your setting is. <laughs> Consult your ID doctor. All right. Parasitic. Be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism. The article, Positive Toxoplasma IgG Serology is associated with increased overall mortality, a propensity score-matched analysis recently published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, So it certainly needs to be reproduced and and perhaps some mechanism identified, but a curious finding. Here they look at 28,138 individuals with available toxoplasma serology results. Uh, This comes from a global database, uh, 80 medical centers in the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, Indonesia, other countries. They report in this analysis that toxoplasmosis positive patients were more likely to have long-term drug use but less likely to suffer from behavioral disorders. Um, The overall one and five year mortality was higher among patients with a positive toxoplasma IgG serology. The risk of schizophrenia was increased at five years. Um, And they're they're gonna say that latent T. gondii associates with a higher overall mortality risk. Um, And we've got some sort of nice uh, Kaplan-Meier survival, uh, bipolar diagnosis, uh, schizophrenia. Um, and so, you know, Toxo is this kind of curious uh, parasite. Um, you know, we have that interesting wolf study. I don't know if people remember that, where the alpha the alpha male wolves are more likely to have T. gondii infections. Um, so always sort of interesting to see how uh, this uh, successful parasite might be impacting um, us. Um, And I will end us with our miscellaneous section. 
you know, all the, I sort of lumped a couple articles together because in JID, they published a couple of things related to fellowship training and ID and sort of the future workforce. And I think the one I'll give a little bit more detail on was uh, analysis of the infectious disease fellowship program directors post-match 2023 survey. Uh, so there was a survey sent to all of the ID program directors nationwide from the IDSA training program directors committee. They were asked to name the top three reasons they believe their program did or did not feel. Uh, the program directors perceived geography, a small applicant pool, and low specialty pay as contributing factors to match results. And they pinpointed specialized fellowship tracks, increasing funding for the ID training pipeline, and national advocacy for higher compensation as areas to focus on to hopefully increase the applicant pool. Um, many of the respondents were hoping to increase their program visibility to potential applicants, whether that was social media or enhancing their program websites or having some open house events. Uh, I thought it was interesting to read how program directors identified a lack of internal candidates as a driver for not filling. Um, and there was a bit of a suggestion of having almost like a regional connection between programs uh, that may help to sort of share recognition for residents who are thinking about ID. Um, and there's a little bit of info there about how, you know, program directors supported the process for international medical grads to apply directly to ID fellowship. Um, and there was a little bit of sort of mixed response, I, it seems like, to uh, having folks who are family med trained come into ID fellowship. Um, I'm a little biased because I always look, you know, to see the impact of combined fellowship programs. You know, MedPeds wasn't specifically mentioned, but I think kind of lumped in there. And I do think um, the, it sounds like the sense from the survey and the authors is that ID has a lot of opportunity to be creative and build these programs and opportunities for prospective ID candidates. And I think some of those sort of new creative things would be thinking beyond you know, the typical stewardship and transplant and so on, but also climate change and health sus disparities and sustainability. Um, and then there's still some controversy on whether the number of programs uh, should be limited. Uh, so, you know, there's a accompanying perspective called ID training in the 21st century, a glass half full or half empty. Um, there's also a call to action, urgently strengthening the future physician scientist workforce in ID, uh, which focused on those who are planning a career as a physician scientist. So I thought I would just end this episode on the reminder that we are still training a total number of people that has continued to increase, meaning even though our percentage is decreased, we are still welcoming in more people into the field of ID than we have in the past years. And I hope that we can adjust the narrative that comes out post-match of ID is dying, woe is us, to our field is vibrant and evolving, and we just need to be a little bit more creative about how to train the future of ID. So that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts or at microbe.tv forward slash puscast. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions, so send them to puscast at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do or you want us to just keep doing it, consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute or Parasites Without Borders at parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the big donate button. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me at swindong at Febrile Podcast or at febrilepodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at Columbia University Irving Medical Center or at parasiteswithoutborders.com, as well as on the other podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in Virology Clinical Updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you Thank you and dictation and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. Infectious.